Over the season of Lent, you've heard me speak about Palm Passion Sunday a number of times, and perhaps that sounds a little bit odd to you because maybe you're used to calling this Palm Sunday. But I've traditionally used this day, Palm Passion Sunday, to talk about the whole of Holy Week, not just what happened on the week before Easter. And that's basically because Palm, because Passion Sunday is the older tradition in church history. See, since the days of the early church, faithful people have remembered the journey that Jesus took on the cross in worship the week before the resurrection. Um, we can't understand Easter, I don't think, and what resurrection means without knowing what led up to it. And it's hard to remember all, all of this Holy Week um, because, not, because much that happened wasn't holy at all. It was dark and treacherous and violent. But then an easy way out came along. In the mid-1800s or so, it became possible for palms to be shipped to towns and cities where churches would buy them. And then this Sunday before Easter became known as Palm Sunday, a day when, in worship, you could wave palms in the air and remember Jesus riding on that humble donkey, entering Jerusalem in a parade. The trouble was, the parade became a celebration, in our minds at least, and that is far from what really happened. So today I'm going to tell you about that parade and actually another parade that happened on that first Palm Sunday. Our gospel writer Mark doesn't describe what happened on the other side of the city of Jerusalem that day, and neither do the other gospel writers because their readers would have already known um, what was going on without them writing about it. But we need to learn about that other parade in order to get the full picture. So Jesus' parade from Bethany into Jerusalem um, took place on the eastern side of the city, um, and it was a smaller parade um, that had to have been planned in deliberate contrast to Pilate's parade happening on the western side of the city. Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor of the area, which was roughly what we consider to be Israel and Palestine today. And while he figures prominently in the Passion Week stories that take place in Jerusalem, and he had residences in Jerusalem, his primary home, he was rich enough to have more than one home, mind you, in those days, his primary home was in the city of Caesarea Maritima, which was a coastal city to the west of Jerusalem. And we know from the biblical accounts of Jesus' trial that he was in town that week. And actually, historians say that it was routine for Pilate and the other governors to come to Jerusalem during major religious uh, festivals to keep the peace. Or, perhaps more accurately, to make sure that the non-Romans who came into the city from the villages and the countryside, didn't use that time to rise up and revolt against Rome. Now, theologically, they knew that whenever there was a religious pilgrimage for the Jews, the time was ripe with language and liturgy that talked about things like release from captivity and freedom from oppressors, and that their Jewish history was that they were a chosen people from God and a holy nation. So Rome knew that if the people were ever to band together and try to overthrow the Roman Empire, it would most likely come in this holy season, around these holy days. So it was part of Pilate's routine to show up in Jerusalem and make Rome's presence known, blatantly and powerfully and militarily and threateningly. So Pilate didn't sneak into town that day. He came in with an army, an army to make sure that everybody knew that the empire was present. As the Jews came in from the countryside, from their little backwater villages, um, as they made their way to their temple for worship, they saw the cavalry on horses, they saw foot soldiers and leather armor and helmets and weapons and banners and Eagle, eagles on top of poles and sun glinting on metal and gold. And they heard all the city noises of marching feet and beating drums. And they felt the swirling of dust 
The eyes of the silent onlookers were awed and sometimes resentful. Pilate's parade was a display of power meant to intimidate. And that's what it did. It declared Rome's power and Rome's theology that Caesar, the emperor, was the son of God. Any other claim of divinity was considered a challenge to the kingdom, one that could legally be met with imprisonment or death. Pilate parading into Jerusalem was a strategy of a system of total domination, one in which the Roman Empire allowed a few wealthy elites to rule over all the rest, lording economic development over them and propping it up with religious language. The parade was the ultimate example of political posturing and jockeying for position, if not by gaining loyal supporters, then by scaring them into submission. Mark, the gospel writer, on the other hand, goes to great lengths to show us that Jesus made his entrance into Jerusalem in a completely different way. He comes from the opposite direction into town. He has planned his entrance just as purposefully as Rome did, but the results of his plan stand in stark contrast to Pilate's efforts. More than half of our gospel lesson this morning is the story of Jesus' entrance um, into Jerusalem, and it tells us how um, his ride was procured. It isn't a well-cared-for stallion that Jesus rides on. It isn't draped with gold or armor. It hasn't been reserved just for him in imperial stables. But it has been picked purposefully. It's a young animal, a horse or donkey, depending on the telling. It was never ridden before, as the Old Testament requirement of the animal um, is to carry the Messiah. And it is also the only animal in that alternative parade. And Jesus is the only attraction. He doesn't come with armies. He doesn't come with guards. He doesn't come with weapons or threats or warnings. No, Jesus comes humbly. He comes welcomed by the people, not feared by them. He comes with shouts of acclamation and recognition that he is the fulfillment of the divine promises. And most of all, he comes peacefully. In fact, the prophecy from Zechariah in the Old Testament that this parade fulfills says that he comes to cut off the chariots and war horses. He comes to break the weapons of battle. He comes to command peace to the nations. These two parades on opposite sides of everything give us a pair of glasses through which we can view Holy Week and the journey that Jesus takes during that week, a lot differently than perhaps we're used to. Jesus entered Jerusalem in a display that says the ways of Rome, the ways of our power-seeking politics, the ways that pit people against each other instead of building up the lowly are not Jesus's ways. They are not the ways of God. These two campaigns highlight the difference between the oppressive powers that try to dominate in the kingdoms and cultures of the world and the peaceful power in the kingdom of God. The poet and writer Steve Garnis Holmes puts it this way. I'm going to share one of his poems. He says, friends, don't get too sentimental about this. To wave our palms is to rebel. There is a king already who does not take kindly to this upstart, there is an empire already, the dominion of self, the kingdom of the habitual, the popular, the dominant culture. To wave your palm is to pledge allegiance to a different realm, to take a different way, not just during this parade, but every moment, every choice of your life. You will pay for it. To bless the humble one is to risk his fate. To cry this Hosanna is to take up your cross. Don't wave that palm unless you mean to resist and you're ready to be labeled subversive and to be punished for it. If you do cry out, Hosanna, save us. Hosanna 
in the highest heaven. These two parades, these two demonstrations, set up the questions that have to be asked of each of us who call ourselves Christians since that very day. Which kingdom will get your loyalty? Which way of life will you choose? What parade will you attend? Let us pray. Oh, holy God, as we journey through this week, help us to understand the actions, to feel the tension, to understand the motives, and to witness to the truth. May our hearts and minds be formed and transformed by his self-sacrificing love. In the name of Jesus, who entered Jerusalem in humility and with purpose, we pray. Amen.